popular history, it seems like the American Revolution was pretty quick and easy to win um, because we are told that Americans were the smart people who were behind the stone walls and the trees while the British conveniently wore red uniforms and clumped in open fields and said, please shoot us. Uh, in a war that was very long, eight years, things were much more complicated. The champions at fighting behind trees and stone walls were actually Native Americans, and most of them sided with the British. The British had their own light infantry, and they had uh, their share of Americans fighting on their side in what was a civil war. So it is not a clear war of Americans against the British. It's a war of a majority of Americans against a coalition of British forces with loyalists and Native peoples. And it's a war in which American forces had to operate in a conventional manner as well as in an irregular fashion in order to win the war. And they could not do this without European help. They did not have the manufacturing capacity. The United States was an agricultural country in which over 95% of the people lived in the countryside. There was virtually no industry. They could not produce the muskets, the bayonets, the cannon, the uniform, all of the kit of modern warfare of the 18th century. They had to import almost all of it. They needed expertise, particularly in engineering and artillery, and so they became dependent upon volunteer officers who had come from Europe. They also needed money because they couldn't afford any of this, and they had to borrow it. They needed credit in Europe. They needed an immense amount of money which contributed to that great national debt that the ambassador just spoke of. And above all, they needed ships, warships, those big 18th century warships. They cost a fortune. They took a long time to build. They required a lot of heavy cannon. The United States simply could not afford a full range navy. It needed an European ally. Now, the number two fleet in the world belonged to France, and the number three belonged to Spain. And if you were going to compete with the Royal Navy to win this war, you ultimately needed the assistance of at least the number two or the number three naval power in the world. And that's ultimately what they got. But there were obstacles to this. On the one hand, as the ambassador very nicely laid out, the British and the French and the Spanish were traditional enemies of one another. And France and Spain were quite keen for payback. But they had to be careful about the timing of it, because it would cost a lot of money, and France's finances were still precarious. The last thing French leaders wanted was to prematurely become involved in a war against the British Empire in which they would be entangled with a losing partner, the American rebels. They had to be sure that the American rebels could sustain their union and could fight the British Empire to a standstill before the French would enter the war as open allies of the United States. And so the initial French position was to provide covert aid, which they could deny that they were in fact providing, rather than enter an open alliance. There were also concerns on the Americans' part. On the one hand, they understood their European needs, but they hoped to obtain them without what they saw as an entangling alliance. Their model treaty that they laid out and proposed in September of 1776 would have reserved all British colonies in North America, including the West Indies, to the United States, barring any European partner from making gains elsewhere in North America. And so American leaders wanted not just to create an independent country, they wanted to create their own empire which is pretty dazzling in its audacity, given how poor and weak the United States was. But it came into existence with quite robust ambitions. And there were also doubts because the great majority of the colonists uh, who had become uh, the independent Americans, they were Protestants. 
and they had traditional enmity with the Catholic powers of France and Spain. So there was concern whether they could trust new allies. And then finally, there was the concern expressed especially by John Adams, who was perhaps the most active and energetic and influential congressman in 1775 and 76. He insisted that what would win the war wouldn't simply be men and material, but it would also be the will to fight. And he insisted that Americans ought to win this war with a minimum of foreign assistance in order to establish the quality of virtue, the capacity for patriotic self-sacrifice. And there was abundant evidence of such patriotic self-sacrifice in the first couple of years of the war, in 1775 and 76. But Adams worried that the United States would become dependent upon foreign allies and would then lapse in their own efforts. Now France decides in early 1778 that the American rebels are a good bet, and they do enter an open alliance. And by that point, the American patriots had lost enough battles to persuade themselves that they needed to make some concessions to reality. And so they had to accept that the French could make gains in the West Indies, that the West Indies would be a French sphere of influence. But they persuaded the French to make a commitment that they would not reacquire Canada during this war. Canada had been acquired by the British Empire in the previous war, as the ambassador has explained. Now, France is doing this at considerable financial risk, and so the hope is that they will win this war pretty quickly. But it doesn't work out that way. Indeed, the capacity for cooperation proves to be very poor in the first couple of campaigns where French and American forces cooperated. They suffered major defeats at Newport, Rhode Island, later in 1778, and at Savannah, Georgia, in 1779. And in both cases, these defeats were a consequence of distrust between commanders, American and French. And indeed, contrary to expectations that the alliance might lead to a quick victory, the war drags on. And the American performance in the war deteriorates after the French alliance. The British make major gains by invading the southern states. Georgia, South Carolina, basically are conquered by the British in 1779 and 1780. They then invade into Virginia, which is the heartland of the United States, and are wreaking enormous damage to the economy and to the morale of people there. Meanwhile, the war stagnates in the north. The British occupy New York City, and American forces are too small to dislodge them. The British are making raids out into the countryside that do not change the strategic situation, but which inflict a lot of pain on civilians in Connecticut and New York and New Jersey. And so as John Adams had feared, the French alliance did give a false confidence to many Americans that the war is largely over. Well, I've got more water coming in. This is... Louise, you are more than efficient. This is like French support for the American revolutionaries. It keeps coming in. There is a decline in enlistments. There, during the 1775-1776 period of enormous enthusiasm for the revolution, the sons of substantial farmers and artisans could be found in the ranks of the Continental Army. But they enlisted for only one-year terms, and so George Washington had to rebuild his army every year. And as you can imagine, the discipline and training of this force was lacking. In 1777, Congress increased the term of enlistment to three years or the duration of the war. Now, Washington welcomed this change, but the longer terms daunted anyone who had much choice in the matter. 
John Adams noted that the Army could no longer recruit, quote, men who could get at home a better living, more comfortable lodgings, more than double the wages, in safety, not exposed to the sicknesses of the camp, end quote. And so poorer men, and often men who had been essentially conscripted, ended up in American forces. In Maryland, a gentleman helped two officers recruit a tavern haunter, quote, who would do to stop a bullet as well as a better man, and as he was a truly worthless dog, he held that the neighborhood would be much indebted to us for taking him away. Now, I don't want to say that all of these poor men who are recruited are of the caliber of this tavern haunter, but it gives you a feel for how desperate recruiting officers are to obtain anybody who could serve in this army. And as marginal men filled the ranks, taxpayers and their politicians became more indifferent about supplying the army with pay, clothing, and food. Congress also mismanaged the commissary and quartermaster departments, which was supposed to supply the troops. Confusion, corruption, and incompetence brought rancid meat, spoiled flour, or nothing at all to army encampments. There was no pay, and the soldiers looked like ragged beggars. Quote, poor fellows, my heart bleeds for them while I damn my country as void of gratitude, end quote, declared one Connecticut lieutenant colonel. The primary problem was that Congress did not have its own power to tax. Instead, it had to rely on quotas assessed on the states. And the states often failed to pay in full or on time. For want of gold and silver from the states, Congress and the states printed up millions of paper dollars and put them into circulation, producing hyperinflation. A pound of beef cost four cents in 1777. It cost $1.69 three years later. In April of 1779, Washington complained that, quote, a wagon load of money will scarcely purchase a wagon loan of provisions, end quote. A year later, a Connecticut congressman deemed the continental currency, quote, fit for little else but to make the tail of a paper kite. There's a problem with desertion. About a fifth of the continental soldiers ended up deserting because they were so discontented with their conditions. And there's an increasing number of mutinies as soldiers go on strike to try to obtain their back pay or better food or better clothing. Rare in the early active years of the Northern War, mutinies became more common between 1779 and 1781. The finest battlefield commander in the Patriot forces was a man named Benedict Arnold. And starving soldiers, decaying currency, bankrupt treasuries, rampant profiteering, and public weariness, Arnold discerned pervasive corruption. And he blamed the French alliance. He saw this as a moral poison and he wanted to reconcile with the British Empire. He concluded, quote, the reunion of the British Empire was the best and only means to dry up the streams of misery that have deluged this country, end quote. And so he tried to betray his command at West Point. He failed in that, but he managed to deliver himself up to British forces, for which he received a payment of 6,000 pounds sterling, a lifetime pension, and a commission and pay as a British major general. So he ended up being the highest paid American-born general in this war. Quote, Arnold has betrayed us. Whom can we trust now, end quote, Washington demanded. And this was an apt question because people started to look to their left and to their right and wonder who could be trusted. And so we come back to Adams's fear that the French alliance would sap the American capacity to contribute to the war. Starved for funds and men, Washington's ragged little army usually had to remain on the defensive, playing the long game of attrition by necessity. It shrank to just 3,500 men in early 1780. This was a quarter of its previous strength. Vergen grew impatient. He wanted the Americans to act more decisively. In October of 1788, excuse me, 1780, Lafayette told Washington that, quote, the French court have often complained to me of the inactivity of the American army, who before the alliance had distinguished themselves by their spirit of enterprise, end quote. Now, Vergen's in a tough spot because debts are mounting 
And he has to decide, is he going to continue to loan money to the United States? And he decides to double down. And it's at that point that he sends 5,000 troops under Rochambeau to double down uh, and invest even more in this apparently failing United States. But what they ultimately needed was a navy, and it's de Grasse who delivers it from the West Indies in 1781 at the lowest ebb of the American Revolution. In June, he received an alarming dispatch from the north, from the Chevalier de la Luzerne, the French ambassador to the United States. Luzerne worried that the British invasion of Virginia under Lord Cornwallis was accelerating the collapse of patriot resolve and unity. He warned de Grasse, quote, it is you alone who can deliver the invaded states from that crisis which is so alarming that for their existence it is necessary to do all you can, end quote. Now, in order to leave the Caribbean, he needed extra Spanish assistance to take over defense responsibilities, not only for the Spanish islands in the Caribbean, but also for the French. He also needed to borrow money, which the Spanish advanced. And so the Spanish contributed in a major way to allow de Grasse to lead his battleships north out of the Caribbean up to the coast of Virginia in order to trap Cornwallis's army. He pulls this off in September and then blocks a British attempt with their own fleet to break into the Chesapeake to rescue Cornwallis. And then the other shoe has to drop, which means that Rochambeau and Washington have to hasten south from New York City, which they had been loosely besieging, and get to Virginia in time while the French fleet is still there blocking the Chesapeake. Now, in the military history of this war, almost everything goes wrong. When you try to plan on a grand scale, when you're trying to coordinate forces over very long distances with very poor communications, and the past coordination between French and American forces had been wretched. So everything seems to conspire against this very complicated plan that you are going to march troops over hundreds of miles south, and you will then be able to coordinate with de Grasse, who has a very limited window in which his fleet's going to be available before he has to go back to the Caribbean, that you will pull this all off and you will trap the British in time, it seems unlikely. But everything goes almost like clockwork. Washington and his side are extremely resourceful in assembling supplies and horses and teamsters and boats and provisions, and the French ante up more money to pay for it all. The Cornwallis has a force of approximately 8,000 men. The land force opposing him that's brought to complete the trap in late September is 16,000. Of them, almost half are French. And then when we add in de Grasse's 19,000 sailors, then we have three times as many French forces at York Yorktown as American combatants. This will be primarily a French victory with American assistance. And it's conducted in a classic European siege involving heavy artillery, most of which is French. They push the cannon ever closer as their trenches go closer. Their fire becomes increasingly accurate and intense, devastating the village and the troops and the civilians within, demoralizing the defenders. On October 19, 1781, Cornwallis surrendered. Now, this is the loss of one quarter British forces in North America. So there's still a larger army in New York. But after this, the political will to fight in Britain collapses over the following winter because this is the second time they've lost a significant army. The first was at Saratoga, and here is the second at Yorktown. And so this will lead to a peace treaty in which the United States is the greatest beneficiary. It makes far greater gains, not only its own independence, but very generous boundaries that will extend west to the Mississippi and north to the Great Lakes and south to the margins of Florida, far more than their forces occupied at the end of the war. <clears throat> 
And so, in conclusion, I just want to emphasize what a remarkable turnabout this was in a very short period of time. In early 1781, many people, including many Americans, thought the United States was collapsing. Respect for Congress had dissolved into mockery, suspicion, and contempt. A Maryland congressman noted, quote, our affairs are in a most wretched situation. Congress is at its wit's ends. And unless the French fleet and army arrive very soon, we shall in all probability be in a most deplorable situation, end quote. A leading Continental Army officer, a man named Alexander Hamilton, who you may have heard of, concluded, quote, if we are to be saved, France and Spain must save us, end quote. This French assistance came at the crucial moment, and it helped to save the cause and win the war in North America. Now, I do understand that nations have interests rather than friends. But when the interests coincide, they can be friends. And what's remarkable about this whole story is that French leadership, Luzerne, Vergen, de Grasse, Rochambeau, acted with a larger strategic vision that was extremely generous to their junior partner, the United States. And it is because of that generosity of vision that they acted in such a decisive manner that ended up winning the war primarily for the United States in 1781. Thank you very much. So I've ended on the early side to allow you either to use the restroom or if you have a question, I would welcome a chance to open it up. Yes. Yes, the, the French uh, uh, finance minister has all along been saying this is not what we should be doing. Uh, but Vergen is in a much stronger position. Um, as uh, Ambassador Aro explained, he's essentially the prime minister. The king trusts in him. The king had had some doubts about this whole enterprise, so the king has to be kept on board. Uh, so there are these concerns. But the, the French forces are so uh, enmeshed in a whole variety of situations around the globe, particularly with the siege of Gibraltar, that um, getting out uh, of anywhere which might pin down some British forces seems like the wrong thing to do to Vergen. And certainly North America is still pinning down a lot of British forces that otherwise could be deployed to places like Gibraltar or India. Well, they hadn't conquered Canada during the war. It still remained in British hands, so that's not really in play. Uh, and then later in the war, meaning 1782, things start to go pretty badly for France. Um, and they suffer a major naval defeat uh, in um, in the West Indies. And after that, they're not really in the position to secure much in the way of concessions in the peace treaty from Great Britain. So in, in the United States, we, we like to emphasize that the British lost the war, which they did in North America, but they won it elsewhere. They actually made gains, particularly in India. And so France is in a relatively weak uh, diplomatic position because it's, it's broke. Uh, yeah, the war is going badly. The British Navy is gaining strength while the French Navy is losing strength in 1782. And uh, Vergen at that point very much wants out of the war. And now his problem is to persuade the Spanish to leave the war because France has made commitments to Spain that they'll stay in as long as Gibraltar is under the British flag. And uh, the British flag still there over Gibraltar. So in theory, if everybody honors their promises to each other, the war of the American Revolution would still be going on. Uh, I do think that France ends up suffering very severely for its um, engagement in this long and very expensive war, absolutely. Uh, and I do think, and I agree with the ambassador, that there is a strategic vision which uh, is long-term, as you suggest, which is that the United States is going to remain a dependent ally on France, and that it will be the weaker partner for a very long time. 
and we will hear later about the peace negotiations and the different positions that the, the French and the United States sought. There is a clash between American ambitions pretty quickly to establish an imperial presence and scale in North America, on the one hand, and France's desire to limit that so that the United States will remain relatively weak and will ally with the French Empire in future wars against the British. And that does not work out uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, but principally the, the collapse of the old regime in France and the creation of a revolutionary regime just transforms geopolitical situations in ways that enable the United States to get out of its treaty of alliance with France. Uh, so, so I'd written an earlier book called American Colonies, and it's about the multiple nature of colonization in North America. It's not just British, but it's also French and S Spanish and Russian and Dutch. And so it emphasized the multiplicity of colonial America. And I, in the new book, which uh, is a sequel, I want to emphasize the multiplicity of the revolution in a couple of senses. One is it affects the whole continent. It, uh, it, it generates a much larger Anglophone refugee population into Canada, which transforms Canada. It, uh, it reinvigorates the Spanish Empire for a time, which expands and reacquires Florida. It uh, affects native peoples deep within the heart of the continent. And so there is a surge in the power of some native groups as a consequence of this, uh, including the Lakota people who become dominant on the upper Great Plains. It accelerates Spanish occupation of California out of concern for British expansion elsewhere in North America. And it changes the West Indies and will lead into a uh, massive slave revolt in San Domingue in the 1790s, which will have further effects. So I want to show the ways in which this war, uh, this revolution, is rippling outward and affecting uh, a much larger geography, and that it involves participation um, by all sorts of people that is often indirect, and to tell that uh, much bigger story. And then I also want to emphasize that there are very different visions within the United States of what the revolution uh, should result in. Uh, there are certain things that there's a consensus about. It should be a Republican system of government. There's an overwhelming consensus for that. But exactly what form that Republican governance should take and where the balance of power should be between uh, the national center and the states is very much in play, uh, and it, just as it's still in play today. When I said San Domingue, San Domingue will become Haiti. Uh, it will become the independent republic of Haiti, well, kind of a republic in 1804. It's, it's actually mostly a monarchy in this period. Uh, Haiti will become an independent country. Uh, it is the, the second independent country in North America. But it is one that is founded out of a slave rebellion in which the vast majority of uh, the, the leadership uh, of this, or all of the leadership by the end, by 1804, are people of color. And this is very disturbing to many Americans, including Thomas Jefferson who feared that this would be a, a sort of contagion of liberty that they did not imagine would happen, and that might come to their shores in a, in a very uh, violent way, that their own slaves might rise up in rebellion. And so it, it leads in the United States to a, a certain anxiety about revolution elsewhere in the world, particularly when it's a revolution which being, is being done by people of color. Uh, and then it also affects relations with France, uh, which will turn quite sour by the end of, uh, of by the 1790s, and um, leads to a sort of war. So I don't entirely agree that the United States and France have, have never been at war. There was this brief, uh, unfortunate war in the late 1790s. So I would say that Saint-Domingue's revolt and the creation of Haiti is one of uh, the most important events in the history of the Western Hemisphere. Louisiana Purchase. Well, it, uh, Napoleon had, had basically put a gun to the head of the Spanish uh, leadership and told them that they were going to give him Louisiana in 1800. So France is suddenly back in a big way, potentially, in North America, right in the heart of North America. And uh, so Thomas Jefferson has just become president uh, with this crisis on his hands. And he's hoping that diplomacy can solve it. And ultimately, diplomacy did solve it, but only because the French army that is being sent to Louisiana is diverted to fight the rebels in Saint-Domingue. 
and are destroyed by that fighting and by yellow fever. So that Napoleon no longer has an army by 1803 that he can send on to Louisiana. And meanwhile, war is going to resume with Great Britain. He needs money. He needs to get what's left of his army in Saint-Domingue back and not have his navy overextended. So he offers the United States a very sweet deal, which is the Louisiana Purchase. And so the rebels in Saint-Domingue are major contributors to this diplomatic coup that will almost double the size of American territorial claims. Okay, thank you very much.